Gig Gab, the podcast for working musicians, episode 241 for Tuesday, January 28th, 2020. Greetings, folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians here in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. I think. Here? <laughs> what do you think? I think. I don't know. I'm here, and I think I know where here is. All it's right. Here in Los- yeah. <laughs> See, you messed me up there. Here in San Jose, California, Paul Kent. That's right. You used to be Los- I, You know, when you said it, I didn't even notice. I'm like, oh, of course that's what he's saying. That's right. It's been a while. It's and- now just a place I used to live. It is just a play. Oh, that, that's something. Yeah. There, there's, there's been songs about that. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hey, um, in the last episode, listener, we have a lot of listener feedback to go through today, which is awesome. And if you want to send yours in, feedback at giggabpodcast.com is a great way to get it to us. In the, uh, in the last episode, 240, I was telling a story about how my friend Adam and I snuck backstage uh, before a Rush concert to try and weasel free tickets. And Dave says, um, you told a story, Dave, listener Dave says this so that I'm not, I'm not talking about myself in the third person. If I ever am, I'll, I'll let you know and hopefully Paul <laughs> will catch me and then we'll just have a sidebar conversation. But uh, he says, you told the story about your encounter with Neil Peart backstage with your fake uh, press badges. Great story, but you left us hanging. What happened? He says, I assume you were made at some point. Were you tossed out the saloon doors onto the street or were you able to keep the charade going a bit longer? So I don't know if we were ever made or not, but it, um, we were just at that, at the, at that point in time, it was Howard Ungleiter, I think was the tour manager as well as lighting director and all that stuff. And, uh, and he said, yeah, I got nothing for you. He looked on his list. He, you know, we had, for those of you that didn't hear, we snuck backstage or we didn't sneak backstage. We printed up little badges on the laser printer on campus and we went backstage and they let us in and uh, we were trying to get free tickets. And in, in addition to encountering Getty and Neil in passing, uh, we spoke with Howard and he was like, yeah, I don't have you on the list. And so we, we left dejected and, and walked back out the door that we came in. No one ever threw us out. It was, it was all quite fine and then and and this will tell you about the time you'll i know you'll chuckle at this paul i assume everybody else will too in the parking lot uh or wherever you know somewhere just outside the venue we found a guy that was selling second row seats and it was a, it was a splurge, but we figured, wow, you know, we just got to meet slash encounter Getty and Neil. We got back to like, ah, we got to we got to close this out. We were college students. We were broke. So we spent the splurge, which was sixty dollars per ticket to uh, to to have seats in the second row for the show in Hartford that night on the uh, Presto tour. So it it did all work out. But the amazing thing is that, you know, sixty dollars was like probably what quadruple or maybe quintuple the price of the face value of the ticket at that point in time, but uh, things have changed. So there you go. <laughs> cool story though. Yeah. 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 So it all worked out and uh, nobody got mad and nobody ate Neil's sandwich. So everything, <laughs> everything worked out. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. It was pointed out in our Facebook group that I mm, was not the most popular person who has ever printed out face fake backstage passes for a rush show, but we might've been first. It's the guys from, uh, from I love you, man, Sydney Fife, and right. I can't remember right, his right. other name. You know, yeah. Anyway, um, Dan had a question for us uh, from a couple of shows back. Uh, I was talking about how I was wearing onesies for the um, for the performances of I guess Rocky Horror, right? I think yeah, it was Rocky Horror, and uh, and Dan says uh, I can totally echo Dave's experience with onesies at my Halloween gig this year. I wore a skeleton costume that was essentially a black onesie with bones printed on its front. The only he says total freedom, which was sort of the thing that I, I stumbled upon with the beauty of the onesie. He says the only problem was no pockets. He says I usually carry guitar picks in the coin pocket of my jeans and hang my IEM body pack from the back pocket. And I had to come up with an alternate uh, alternative approach for both of these things. Interestingly, the fact of a onesie not having pockets didn't strike me until I was actually in the onesie 
in the bar bathroom. So I had to figure it out on the spot. Yeah, I had a similar problem. I don't have to worry about guitar picks, but I do have my in-ear monitors. Now, because I'm a drummer, uh, I don't have to, I, I don't care about having wireless, right? It, I, I certainly have uh, used a wireless unit before with, with IEMs, but it's one extra battery to deal with and it messes with audio quality because of just the way it does it. And I don't need it. So I have a, a cable from a headphone mixer. I use the rolls uh, PM 50 S, which we've talked about on the show before it's cheap, it's like 50 bucks and it works out great, but I have a cable that I run from that. And I usually leave it across my drum stool. I've found a white cable is the right color to use because I can see it in the dark when I walk on stage. Um, mm. But I, I, what I do is I have my, my in-ears, obviously they go in my ears. I have them go down my back and then I usually take um, a, just a cheap attenuator, like an inline attenuator volume control knob that has a headphone jack on one side and a headphone port on the other. And I plug my in-ears into that and then I tie the attenuator around a belt loop. That way it's there. I have volume control on my on my hip, but I also if something y tugs on the cord, it's not tugging on my ears. And that's sort of the most important part of that whole setup. So I cut a I, I brought pinking shears with me because I did think about this in advance and I cut two small holes about a half inch apart in my onesie and I tied instead of tying it to my belt loop, I tied the attenuator to that and that allowed me to have the cable for my ears inside the onesie and then the uh, the cable for the attenuator to plug into the thing on the outside to the cable on the outside and it all worked out. But yeah, that is, that is something to think about. You know, I hadn't, I hadn't thought about what else to do if I had to move around a bunch certainly with a wireless pack that wouldn't work because the, the onesie wouldn't have held it up in any way. But um, I see a lot of our, our theater performers use wireless mics all the time and they use like, um, I'll say chest straps uh, that sort of go around their, their chest or, or maybe they're just their midsection that have a little pouch for the wireless uh, receiver in a uh, transmitter in their case, because it's the um, it's for a microphone, but obviously a receiver could, could fit. And I found them for like 20 bucks on Amazon. So I'll put a link to that in the show notes. They call the one that I found a tune belt microphone belt. And it's, it just, it, they, they can put it on underneath their costume and it just stays right in place. And you know, it's, it's pretty, um, that's pretty good. So I'll, I'll put a link to that. This so is the most I've ever heard the word onesie used in such a short period of time in my life. I know it's crazy, right? But, um, somehow that's, uh, that's how it goes. What kind um, of onesie gab right now. It's a onesie gab people. It's someone at the, at the gig, the second Rocky horror show, uh, asked me, they're like, where do you get your onesies? And that's when I knew maybe I had a problem. Um, <laughs> so I, I told them onesies are us. That's not quite true. I um, Onesie world. Onesie world. There you go. Yeah. No, I, I think I bought the house of onesies. <laughs> house of onesies. That's what it's going to become if I keep getting these things, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Well. Um, Eric had a question here about, well, let's, let's just let Eric sh share his question and see where we get with this, Paul. Eric says, uh, I've been thinking a lot about where I fit in, in the music network. That is my area. He says, I'm a side guy. At least that's what's on my rap sheet. He says, I play with a few different artists and bands who would probably all consider me a vital aspect of their music and a good and close friend as I would to them. But where is the line? Obviously, if people who play music together do it for an extended amount of time, bonds get made. Friendships are created. And in some cases, they might be stronger than friends with whom I don't share music. Right. He says, I think the answer uh, is simply just a case by case basis. But there's a certain status quo. Is there a certain status quo that a side man should stick to? When do we allow our relationships with each other to affect or even jeopardize the music? Does the music have to come first or do the friendships come first? If it wasn't for music, the friendship might not have been there in the first place. Uh, and he, he has, has an example. He says, a singer I work with has been struggling with their voice. And he says, I actually think um, it's become a very topic 
for me to get behind the idea of addressing. They honestly don't have the strongest voice, he says, to begin with, but it's more than able to be fixed. Do I play the friend card and talk it out and feel like I'm helping or do I keep my mouth shut and continue to roll the dice with our success? Wow. So uh, I, I like the, the general question and I really appreciate sort of the specific example because it, it gives us a little something to sink our teeth into here. So, um, so I've been talking for a while cause you know, Mr. Onesie here and, and Mr. <laughs> Fake backstage pass. So I've, I've got a lot to say about this, but I'm curious what your thoughts are, man. Yeah. So um, what an interesting topic. So there's a discussion going on that I was, that I was reading on one of the other um, band um, chat boards on Facebook. And the premise was um, I own the equipment. I book the band. I do all the work. Um, I take an extra cut. Wait, and, wait, we're talking about two different things. Nope. We're gonna, okay. I'll, I'll bring it back around. You're bringing it right? back around. Okay. All right. Okay. I promise. Okay. I'm all with right. you. I, Cause I thought maybe you would jump to the next question. <laughs> no. Okay. Sorry. And so, <laughs> and so, you know, this guy said, you know, this is, this is the way I run my band. Right. And the, there were like 400 responses. Okay. And obviously I can, I can identify with where this guy was coming from. Sure. Uh, Cause it's the model I use. And the interesting thing about responses, and I actually ping back to our discussion about, about leader courtesies and all those types of things. And what the way that I tie these two topics together is, you know, musicians are, are different in that they, they see a lot of social norms in a different way. This, this Facebook thread that I was reading, musicians were blasting this guy, you know, and, you know, saying, you know, what, what does it matter if you bought the gear to band? Everybody should be paid the same. And, you know, and, and many other much more harsher approaches to things like, you know, you're an idiot. I wouldn't play for you. And, and that's where these two conversations come together is that, you know, when you, when you are socializing the task of, of musicians, socializing the environment, that that's how really I can talk about Eric's, yeah about Eric's comment is that, you know, what we say all the time here is over communicate, communicate, communicate. That, that's what's important. But even in good communication, the way things are sent and received, uh, musicians aren't always the greatest social communicators to begin with. Now, I'm going to come back to Eric specifically saying, I, now me, I'm finding more and more I am accepting as a matter of fact that there is a different way to think about talking to musicians, certainly different than people in my day job. Right. Yes. It's just, it's just a different language. Fair. Right. Yep. Yep. And, and I find that getting stuff done, and, and this is where you will agree. We are quite different. The black and whites are very black and white to me there. I mean, they really are. And I think you live in the, in the musician mindset way easier than I do, Dave. And so you kind of have a sense of the sensibilities in a much different way than I do. So regarding Eric's comment specifically, what I think is communication is a really important thing. Friendships are an interesting thing in the realm of music. They're great when they're great. They're very um, painful when they're not great. Um, and sometimes they're not great because being an artist mixes an, an ever-changing um, degree, you know, of ego, common sense, um, uh, goodwill, um, background, security, insecurity. Um, there's a lot of things that go on there. And th this is, again, I, I think as I'm saying this, I'm just kind of reflecting. This is the way my brain kind of grocks the whole yeah. interacting with, with creative people things. And, you know, in my day job, I, did, I had to deal with creative people in a much, in a, in, a, in a similar way, but it was a pretty cut and dry. Like, if you do this, I'll pay this. And, and are we good? We're good. All right, good. Right. And, um, but in music, there's a little bit of, but we're bros, but we're in this together. But, you know, I don't want to do that. Or I'm, you know, it, it's a, it's a moving line to me when you're inside the mind of an artist. And so I would say with regarding Eric, sideman, do's and don'ts, whether he should speak up, I would, in my mind, a sideman, truly, specifically a sideman, um, gives input when asked, right? Your job is to show up and play your stuff. If you are investing your time into being in the band and you are making a commitment of your 
resources, your time, your money, your, your, you know, your, your chops, um, then that's a different thing. And you are welcome to kind of contribute to the problem solving of improving your product because it's, it's your investment as well. So that's, that's kind of how I see those two things. If you are literally a hired gun, you're there to play your parts. If you are part of something and investing in something that is going to go to another place, then you are, you are, I would say welcome and expected. My group is, is, is interesting because it, it falls between those things. You know, I've always wanted the guys to be friends. I've always wanted, you know, us all to get along as, you know, almost like family. And a lot of the guys do refer to it as family. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I would say those are those are hard things that take a lot of nurturing, tending to on a constant basis. And um, again, in my mind, if he's asking about sidemen do's and don'ts, I think it's if you're a sideman, you show up, you play, you smile, <laughs> you know, you're pleasant to be around so you can get the call again, right. play your butt <laughs> off. Right. And and yeah. you've, you've contributed what you was expected to do as a sideman. If you are a part of a, you know, have some kind of investment in a project, um, then you are entitled to, and then if the leader is smart, encouraged to speak up and problem solve. How's that? I I actually agree with you. You, you know, the fir- the where it's weird is when the line gets blurred, right? Because when you're a side man on the first gig, it unless it, uh, let's assume you don't have any prior relationship with these people other than, you know, you, you worked out the details and you're going to show up and bring your acts and play. Right. Uh, you learn the songs, maybe you have a rehearsal or whatever, but you know, you, 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 these aren't people you've known for 10 years. Yeah. So you show up, you play the gig and uh, you are definitely a side man, you know, and, and like having, even having joined, um, you know, G- Gary's band with, with Uptown Celebration, like day number one, I'm Dave, the drummer showing up to bang drum, you know, and that's that's my job. And it's not my job to to have any opinions about anything. But where it, the line starts to blur is that you are, you know, there is the leader in that scenario. You know, it's a very much a leader led band. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, there is the leader of the band. And then there are the people that he hires. Right. But where that mostly ends is the moment we all step on stage together. Right. And at least from for the couple of hours that you're on stage. Yes. Somebody's got to call the shots on stage and somebody needs to be the leader there. But everybody's playing the songs together. It's not like the leader is in, in this scenario or in your scenario. It's not like the leader is standing off the stage directing all of the musicians. The leader is one of the musicians. And that's where I think the lines very get blurred a lot more quickly than they would in say a corporate environment or, you know, something like that. If, if you were, if the, you know, let's say five members or seven, 10 members, doesn't matter if the entirety of the band was hired by someone else and everybody on stage is a side man, then it, it would probably remain that way for a very long period of time or could, but it's, Can you be a little more specific? So you're, you're basically saying that on stage, the line blurs a little bit and a side man's role is a little different than it is. I would say not the side man's role. The leader's role changes on ah. stage. It, not that not that someone doesn't need to lead the band. Someone does. But everybody's playing these songs together and you've got to lock in together and you've got to listen to each other and you've got to play off of each other and all of that stuff. So the relationship accelerates. Uh, much faster than it would if you were just, you know, say working in an office environment. At least that's been the case for me. It, you know, very, very quickly, I develop bonds with the musicians that I play with much faster than I do any other project that I work on with people. And I think it has to do with the fact that you're creating live art together and you need to trust each other, right? Like that trust has to happen right out of the gate, uh, mm. you know? And so, so I think that's part of where it gets blurry faster. I mean, if you work with somebody for 10 years in, in a corporate environment or whatever, like it's also going to get blurry and, and messy potentially uh, depends on, you know, but it depends on how things go. You know, it, you, if you're only ever seeing each other, you know, at work and then you go home to your families and you never hang out or anything like that, it's fine. But at a gig, you do wind up hanging out. You know, you're usually in a bar. You've got set breaks together where you just like that's not work time. There's no question 
that mm. sitting together on the set break or before the gig, like we do. I mean, in Uptown, we've probably spent more time together, you know, waiting to play than we have playing. Uh, and and so you just hang out and you wind up talking with each other and learning about each other and you start becoming friendly with each other and and learning far more about someone's personal life than I would at in a corporate environment at that speed, you know. Sure. So I think that's where things get blurred and the worlds start to get merged because um because that's generally how it works. I've never been in a leader led band where the leader distances him or herself from that stuff. It always seems to just you know, kind of get blurred really, really quickly. So in Eric's scenario, it sounds like he's been in this, this particular band, but also several others or been playing with this particular unit of musicians long enough that at least in his mind, he feels comfortable with these people as friends. And my guess is assuming Eric has the uh, ability to read the room at some level that these other people think of him as a friend. And so that's where it starts to get a little interesting. And should he say something, I would say, forget about whether or not you are a side man in that to make that decision. Forget about the fact that you're a side man. Think about what is the level of my friendship with this person? How much do we trust each other? And if I were in this scenario, would I want them to say something to me? Not as the person they're hiring to play, but as a friend. You know, if like, hey, there's something going on, I, I want to help you. And if it truly is that, then I would say, say something, you know, but but I mean, Check this, this is out. years down the road uh, of a relationship versus, you know, date gig number two. There's a, yeah. there's, you know, right. Like it's it's not it's not black and white. It's tough. Yeah. I in my band, you know, big band, I have. I have nine, well, nine guys and a sound guy, right? So 10, 10 guys that are, you know, our band in addition to me. Right. And um, I find that some of the guys have gotten close. Some of the guys are cautious about getting close. Some, they all have different relationships with leadership, you know, that, that I have to be aware of. Here's a good question for you. Yeah. Have you ever done a gig soon after it was tense in a leader led band and you get to the gig and there's kind of a, you know, well, you know, some words were said or some you know feelings were exposed, you know, in the last rehearsal and there's still a little bit of a bruising um, that exists and there's a dynamic, you know, a leader plays the leader card and says, well, you know, I, I got to just say, we got to do this. And some guys are not happy with it. That happens at the previous rehearsal. And, you, you know, there's just some, raw feelings going on and then you have a gig coming up next uh have you ever been in a situation like that yeah i've been in that situation with leader led bands and i've been in that situation with democratic bands i mean democratic there's there's a little bit of a sensitivity right and and oh yeah well how about this how is it different like do you do you can you be aware that the guys are like whoa you know he was our buddy you know and now he's our boss you know because you know some some difficult thing was was uh was brought up and, you know, are you aware of the sensitivity that people have towards a leader when he has to do something that's unpopular? Yeah. And again, I you know, th- this idea that that th- the band is either either leader led or has no leader it is is a false truth. Right. Like there are always going to be leaders, no matter what the official power structure is. And the, and when in, you're in this scenario, we're talk you're talking about here. It's literally no different. Um, you know, in a, in a, like comparing, say a fling scenario to an uptown scenario, right. Where fling is basically a democratic band, but at different times and for different jobs, different people are the leader of those things. And so sometimes it's like, well, this is how it's going to be. This is what I've put together. You know, somebody has got to pick and say, here, here we go. If we're, if we're not all on the same page, someone's page is going to be the page that we have to follow. Right. Cause you can't, go on stage otherwise. And so, yeah, it, it is that thing. And I often, I, I'm the type of person, I mean, I'm a talker here we are. Right. <laughs> so I'm the type of person that does not like to leave anything. Uh, I don't like elephants in the room. I just like to address it head on. So, and it might be one of those things where, you know, at the prior, at the rehearsal prior to the gig, things got weird for, you know, for exactly the reasons that you're describing. 
and you get to the gig and usually in the process of setting up is where it seems like the band is starting to gel a little bit with each other. You know, you're all kind of shared mission and everybody's working toward the same goal. And it's like, all right, hey, you know, if 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 there's if there's an apology to be made, make the apology or or if there's not, if it's just like, well, this is the scenario, you know, kind of point at it and laugh at it like, you know, but I'm glad we're all on the same page because otherwise this gig could be a disaster or something like that. You know, and again, you got to be able to read the room. And but I, I find that that just to break the ice, to break the tension is way better than getting on stage without having acknowledged this, you know, this thing that that clearly everybody knows about. If we all know about it, somebody should just I, and it will usually be me. Just say something and be like, wow, that, that last rehearsal was a little bit of a mess. I'm glad right. we're all here. Like, I'm, I'm glad we're all working together here and I'm looking forward to the gig or something yeah. like that. You know, you're a good band guy. You, you really are. You're a good band guy and you have good communication skills. You know, I, I find that, you know, obviously not everybody, not every human being, much less every musician has good communication skills and people's relationship to conflict is a very complicated thing, right? That's exactly it. It's the relationship to conflict that you, you, you hit the nail on the head. And I, I mean, I can come across as a jackass sometimes because I'm willing to acknowledge conflict. Um, you know, it doesn't conflict. I mean, I don't necessarily like it, but it doesn't, it doesn't shut me down. Uh, You know, I, I react to it just the way I, I described. So at least I hope I do sometimes not quite as productively as that, but you know, the goal is that, and um, so, yeah, it, it, but some people are very much, uh, you know, conflict averse. And that's why I will be the one to, to just break the ice. And then usually once the ice is broken, the people that are conflict averse, then they open up a little bit. And that to me is the point of of just sort of acknowledging it, maybe making light of either it or the fact that it happened. If whatever it is, is not something to be made light of, you know. Like, here we all are. Wow. You know, what a difference a couple of days makes like those types of, you know, whatever the right thing to say is, I try to come up with it and I don't always get it right. And if I and if I do get it wrong, even that can be a great thing, because now we can laugh at me how poorly I brought this thing back out into the open. You know what I mean? Then then there's a little bit of humility and everybody's laughing. And now we get on stage and we're playing like a band. No, I, I think that that's a great thing. And having that role in a band sometimes Sometimes it's, well, I guess it's great if you have that guy in the band. Otherwise, the leader has to do it. You know, I kind of have a rule, you know, there's, there is no fighting at a gig, right? You know, if if Mm -hmm. you simply, if two guys aren't getting along, go to your corner and, you know, just play your butt off and, you know, be your own thing for that night and we'll get to it. But whatever, whatever the deal is, yeah, the, the, um, you know, gig day is sacred and certainly stage time is sacred. And so, you know, that's not the time for conflicts to, you know, to be a part of the experience. I mean, you ever had a conflict on stage? Like, like something brew up that should not have. Uh, let's see. I think, well, yes. And um, I think over the years I've learned to really deflect it fast, you know, like a raised eyebrow at, at a missed part or a muff or something like that. Um you know, I've had guys who it really sets them off and, mm. you know, the, the two of them want to go at it, you know, like, well, don't mess up your part. Well, you don't need, need to call me out on stage. Right. That type of thing. Yeah. I've had that. I've had, um, I've had, I've never two, had, I've, had I've never had like a bass a, players I, walk off stage for, oh dip, for, for a variety like wildly different reasons, but, um, it pissed off about something going on with the gig and then they just leave. Oh my gosh. What the hell are we supposed to do? Like, thanks. That's crazy. Cool. Yeah. Yep. (laughs) I know. (laughs) But I, I, all this is really revolving around that really interesting question that Eric asked about, you know, that, that gray area of friend, side man, bandmate. And I think, you know, again, no, no two situations are the same. Right. To me, the black and white part is if you're literally a side man, you play. That's right? it. That's oh, it's the easiest it. thing. Yeah. That's the easiest thing. Yeah. And if, yeah. you know, if, but that whole friend bandmate, when do I talk? When do I not talk? You know, there's a million variables and it's like, how good are you at creating con- a constructive environment for people to hear your, your input? Right. I'm not even going to call it criticism. Just, you know, hearing what you have to say, is it a constructive 
Is it a constructive environment? The one that you can create or one that the band leader creates or that the whole band creates is, can that type of information be shared back and forth? And um, yeah, is there, you know, is there an opportunity slash Avenue for that? Because you're right. Like let's, let's take Eric's specific example. You know, should he approach this singer five minutes before downbeat and say, Hey, you know, I, I know there's no. some things going on with your voice. Obviously <laughs> no. Right. That would be terrible. And even right after the gig finishes is also a really bad time for that. Emotions are too high. Yeah. Emotions are too, everything's too raw. Yeah. So finding that opportunity and, and you know, you're, Band doesn't always have that opportunity. I mean, if all you're doing is getting together for gigs and occasional rehearsals and everybody's time is tight and all that stuff, that can be tough. You know, we, I, it's funny. I had, I did not think these two things were related, but we recently had a fling, uh, lunch where we, we, we had a rehearsal, but it was happening later that day. And we all just went and met for lunch and, and had lunch together. And we hung out for like two hours and just chit chatted and, and all of that stuff. A little bit of, you know, what I'll call band business sort of filtered in at, at points. But for the most part, it was just the guys getting together and, and hanging out with each other. And I realized we need to be more intentional about that. We've had band sleepovers. We One of our guys has a house uh, over in Maine, like a vacation home. And we've done where we, you know, you go up there for a night or two or whatever and just hang out, play some music every now and then here and there. But otherwise, just hang out for the weekend. And those kinds of things are really good because they create the environment where even if it doesn't happen there, that it paves that foundation of friendship and trust where you could and, and you maybe this isn't the kind of thing, especially Eric's example, where you want to bring it up in front of the whole group. That's generally not a good idea, in my opinion. But, mm -hmm. you know, by having these bonding experience that, that are separate from the stage, not to say that the stage isn't a bonding experience. It is. But having these separate things, you know, allows you to sort of pick up the phone and call somebody and say, hey, man, you know, I want to there's something I want to talk about. And I think I might be able to help you with or at least point you in the right direction. Um, yeah. I think bands go through um, different kind of phases where the usefulness of that is different. Like I know our band has gone through phases where it's everybody's busy and you show up for a gig and you play and you're reminded how great it is to have this thing that is, a, you know, a well-oiled machine. Yeah. And then you go back and you deal with the rest of life and there's not a need for establishing that fabric. The the gigs almost remind you that that fabric exists and it's, totally. you know, it's, it's there. I, you know, band retreats to solve problems that goes back to the, you know, the style of communication a band has. That could be the worst thing in the world. Right. Oh, yeah. No, so, I know our, like, our band retreats were never to solve problems. They were just to enjoy time together. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah for sure. But yeah. And I think that those things are good. You know, we, our keyboard player likes to have guys over for dinner and and hosts yeah. quite often. And it's just and, and really when there's no business to be talked about and you can just kind of tell stories of other gigs, you know, other experiences that you've had. Those are great bonding things. And I think that those are a lot of fun. I've, I've called many meetings, you know, when the band like a couple many years ago, um, we went through a stretch where it just wasn't happening. We weren't clicking. And so I just, you know call the rhythm section together for like, you know, guys, we're not, we're not getting it done. You know, let, let's figure it out. And um, everybody knew we weren't getting this. We were on the same page going into the problem solving. And that was a good thing. That's a good thing. Um, yeah. And, you know, we've had at the end of a lot of rehearsals, you know, sometimes we have business talks, um, but in general, but we have you know, like, Hey, we haven't done a band dinner in a while. Let's, let's all meet somewhere and go out. Those have been really productive and fun. If the air is clear, you know, again, right. if you have tension and drama, it kind of permeates everything. And, and it's hard to just, it's hard to just roll over that stuff. Sometimes you just got to let it die, you know, and, 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 you know, time evaporate. He time heals all wounds. That's yes. right. Sometimes that's Sometimes. the best approach. Yeah. 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 You, you can't, like you said, you like to not address the elephant in the room. I would say, from my perspective, not every elephant needs to be addressed. Sometimes I know that there's different guys in my band who at different times are not on the same page. And I can f sense the animosity and tension rising and falling because it falls also. Yes. And, you know, it, I don't need to put on my referee shirt until you guys, you know, hug it out and let's move on in most cases. Right. Um, 
occasionally there is a situation where you've got to be like, all right, guys, let's get in the way of everything. You know, I will, I will say this as someone who has experienced lots of different um, interpersonal dynamic scenarios. There are times absolutely when it's just best to let it go. Right. But if there's something that is recurring or, you know, if there's one person that is constantly, um, you know, if there's one person that, that's either upset or causing problems, like the result, the, the, the target of a problem or the, or the cause of a problem, if you let that go repeatedly, that's the kind of thing that will fester and tear your band apart. It will tear a family apart. It will tear everything apart. Right. This is we're not just talking about bands here. Uh, it, you, you know, and so that that's where I definitely over I shoot I shoot too far on the, you know, uh, should we talk about it scale? It's like I I will choose yes way more often than uh, than I would choose no. And and, you know, there there are times when I've brought something up and in, in retrospect, it's like, yeah, you know, I wonder if it would have been better if I just didn't say anything, you know, <laughs> but yeah. um you know, better to address the elephant is my, I will err on the side of addressing the elephant, but, but again, that's just me. And, and, you know, that's quite frankly, the baggage I bring to the, to the scenario, right? Because I've, yep. I've learned the hard way that, that, that has not worked, but it, it means that I will occasionally, I say err on the side and I mean air on the side of potentially bringing something up that was like, yeah, you know what? That didn't need to be brought up. That was, but you think yeah. about, think about most bands that you're aware of that have been in business for years and years and years, right? Yeah. It's there's very, are there any stories of where it's been a smooth ride for the whole time? I don't think that could exist. I, no, I, it can exist. I was, I was, I was, you know, because Peart died, I've been reading lots of different stories that people have had about him. And, and there was, uh, I guess it was one of his books that I've been rereading the far and far and away uh, book. But um, he said he was being interviewed by someone who was trying to like, they wanted to address at one point in the interview, his relationship with Getty Lee, you know, the uh, obviously his bandmate, but the bass player. And he was, you know, trying to like dig into that. And how do you guys work together? Okay. And then he's like, have you ever thought about, you know, why Getty is the way he is? And Neil's response to that was, oh, no, no, no. Like, this is the guy that I work with. I, and and we don't want to change the fact that we like working together. So, yes, we all have our quirks, but it does. It's not a we figured it out. Clearly, we figured it out. And, you know, I think at this point they had been in, you know, in a band together for two decades or something, you know, by the time this person was interviewing him. It's like, I don't have, I, it's like, I have no interest in trying to dig into his head, especially not with somebody else, but probably not even on his own. You know, he's like, it works. I don't, we all are weird. It's fine. It's fine. Leave it alone. But isn't that, that would be, that would be Nirvana. If everybody had that perspective going into a band. Yeah. This works. Let's not mess with it. You know, everybody gets to be weird. And as long as we show up and, you know, we do our job. I guess, you know, it's quite a bit of that. You know, a lot of band conflict comes from projecting something onto somebody. You're forcing someone to either defend themselves or, you know, explore some insecurity or something like that. I, that is a kind of a good golden rule that that one of the keys to longevity and playing music with other people is you got to give them, you know, their space. That yeah. might include giving them their space to figure out their vocal problems, right? Yeah. You know, yeah. So th this would be an interesting question for Eric is, you know, right. is the guy aware and is he determined to work it out himself? That's a really profound question, right? So a guy who doesn't want to admit to his fault, you know, first of all, you better be darn sure that you have read the guy right. You know, like I know, yeah. you know, when I have faults, I know them and I will woodshed what I can. And it takes whatever time it takes for me to iron things, some things out right? A part, a vocal part, a guitar part, you know, a management issue, whatever it is. I, I consider myself reasonably self-aware um, as a strength. Um, I'm open. I'm open to hearing things, but don't assume because you're telling me something that you've identified something that I don't already know. And don't assume that I'm working through it, right? And I think that's the whole thing is once someone gets up their dander to, to, 
to want to project something onto someone else. Now, now that's out there in the air and that guy has to now defend that. And that's his position. And everybody knows that's the position. And that's the whole thing about ban back and forth. You know, it, it, when you call someone out again, I've played with guys who are like guys in the rehearsal room, we have to be, you know, merciless with each other. It's the only way we'll get better. I don't, by that, right? I don't. I don't believe that calling people out. It depends on the person. Some it, dep- people, it depends on the person. I, y- absolutely. But, you know. So let's say. Let's say with you, and I'm making up a for instance scenario, but I'm using the the you as the example because you said that if you have a problem, you're generally aware of it. Well, what happens if Eric's in your band and he comes up and he's not, by the way, this is not one of Paul's bandmates sending in a, a note anonymously. So I truly am just making this up. But let's say Eric comes up to you and says, hey, man, you know, I, I want to talk about this problem that you have with your voice. Now, he's assuming by saying it that way that you know about it. What happens if if you hear someone saying that to you and it's like. Um, I don't have a pri- f you. I don't have a problem with my voice. Like so, so it, me. You know, that's, here's a checklist, right? Yeah. So, depending upon a million other things, what kind of day I'm having, of what kind of relationship I have with this. My first thing might be f you, but I guarantee you, for me, yeah. My second thing is I would go try and listen to something and see if there's a point. You know, I would, fact I, check, right? I would too. Yeah, that might. It, you're so, right. So, it might be the second thing, but it's either first or second. But the first might be f you. Yeah, that's right. And yeah. and I would say for me. Um, the same, um, the same expectation that I'm going to try and take care of my stuff and fix my stuff. I offer to someone else, right? So the communicating is one part of it, but if after communicating, if it turns into, I told you, why are you still doing this thing that way? Um, that creates another layer. That's, un- of, that's of unhelpful. Right? Yeah. But that's that- the point I'm making is just you identifying a problem. You may not have identified something that the person doesn't already know. Right. Number two, how you communicate this issue. Number three, what the person who has communicated this to does with the information and, and what they already knew about the situation is another part of the you know kind of, kind of complexity of two bandmates kind of talking to each other. So, you know, and then there's the, the everybody's tolerance. Here's a, here's a good one for you. So um, I play with guys who I can call anything, anytime, and they're up to give it a try. I play with guys who are, if it, if it hasn't been rehearsed, don't do it. This is our brand. Why would we ever want to look unprofessional? Sure. Two very different schools of thought, right? Yep. I have a tolerance uh, and I make a calculation. If someone makes a request for something I'm pretty sure my band can get through the net value in that moment of honoring the request, the audience kind of going along with us that, you know, we're doing something unrehearsed. The value of winning that moment is more than the value of showing musical proficiency often, not all the time. I, I, I am of that same mindset. Yes. Um, You can, you can go too far with that. For sure. You can't. Uh, but but I am of that same mindset, especially if you've already, you know, if the crowd is already on your side and now they're asking you for something, delivering that to them can really, really win it, especially if they see that you're, you know, faking your way through it, for lack of a better term. And everybody's sort of having fun in this moment. And it's all everybody's in on it. The the only the, the quite frankly, from from my perspective, the only issue there is the person that walks in in the middle of that right like do they understand the context of why you're but that's that's the the risk reward that's right? the you're, risk you know, like, no well so and 95 percent of the room that is going to get a kick out of the out exactly. of the you know, goodwill and effort for the entertainment versus the five percent that are the musical purists you know what is the calculated risk for reward no, i i would take it every time I, but i would right. also but but to manage that risk, I wouldn't do it for five songs in a row. Right. No. I would you, you know, you you follow that up with something where you can like get back to home. And it's like, OK, great. Like, oh, look at that. Even if you walked in in the middle of, you know, some awful hacked up performance of Billy Jean yep. because somebody requested it. Well, now you're back to, you know, long train running and, and, and that's in your band's wheelhouse and you kill it. And it's like, oh, wait a minute. OK, well, this is cool. What is this band about? Wait, a, you know, I that would pique my curiosity if I walked in in the middle of that uh, yeah. for sure. So, yeah, no, I, I'm I'm I think we're on the same page with this one here. It's a tough scenario. Really, what you want to do is foster um, 
an attitude in your band or an environment in your band where people feel like they can tell one another as bandmates, Hey, I have a problem. I'm working through it. You, you know, like when, when I was having all those issues with my voice that turned out to be my mic being on my wrong side of my, my setup here, which, which pre, which dates all the way back to my Bell's palsy and how the right side of my face is still slightly weaker than the left side. Um, and which also means the right side of my throat, uh, that, you know, the best thing that I did was asking my bandmates, one of whom at the time, uh, she's a vocal coach and, you know, knows all sorts of things about the way the larynx, larynx works. And she does a lot of laryngeal massage and all this other stuff. So, I mean, she was definitely the right person to ask. But and I knew I could ask her. But even bringing that up and I and like there was the environment, especially that environment is so supportive that the, that there was no question that if I brought something, uh, you know, showed a sign of weakness that it would like, no one would, would say, Oh, well, the, you're out, you know, like there was no risk of that, but even still bringing it up is hard, uh, you know, but, but creating that environment that's supportive um, is, I think in the end, more productive, it's not easy and certainly if you have an environment like you said, where everybody's calling each other out all the time, I, I think that's counterproductive to the, um, you know, especially if they're just count, calling each other out and saying, you got to fix this. It, it, right. There's a, you know, there's a way of saying, hey, man, I know you're having trouble with this, um, you know, counting this section or whatever. Here's c can I offer you some help? Right. First of all, like, can I offer you some help? is is a nice question to ask you know acknowledge the issue can i offer you some help and somebody might say no i you know i've got this i i, I think i can get there okay then you got to back off right but if, if you say can i offer you some help and somebody's like yeah what do you what do you got in mind then say oh well you know here's how i think of this or here's three different ways of thinking of it and maybe one of these will resonate with you so that you mm -hmm. can find a way through like there's ways of being supportive uh, and still being the one to offer the help as opposed to just, you know, asking, uh, waiting for someone to ask for it because someone might not feel comfortable asking. But if you say, hey, you know, I want to help. Do you want my help? That, you know, that a lot that goes a long way. And I say that knowing that I need to be better about that part of it. You know, do you want my help? There's a I think there's a valuable um, that's that's the that's going to be my new my new mantra. I had to learn that with my kids. So, yeah, yeah. You know, try and offer help. And I, it, feel like it's I, good. It's, I don't want it. It is useful to check yourself and, you know, ask yourself, how's this working for you? You know, like if your approach to communicating, if you find that you're like, I'm just trying to be a good guy, but you constantly are getting consternation back. You might want to just check if you're tacked. That's is, it. It's uh, the approach. Is, yeah. Yeah. Your heart's in the right place. If you if you truly are just doing it to help people, there are some folks and I, I put myself in this group. Sometimes I try not to be in it, but there's sometimes frustration leads to I want to point this out because, my gosh, it's driving me crazy that, you, you know, th that's a good moment to swallow that stuff and not yeah. acknowledge because the elephant in the room might really just be in your head. So, yep. <laughs> If it's just, but I, I would just to close on this, I would say that the whole concept of friendships within a band are a really interesting thing. They're, they're, it's, uh, you start with this, hey, we're going to make music together and we're going to make people happy together, you know, let's bond and everything like that. And then, and then, you know, you're, everybody's bringing X amount of years of life experiences and baggage as to how to do things. It's amazing bands stay together. I think Steve Van Zandt said that, like, if you have a band that works, treasure it and do what you can to protect it because it's such a damn rare thing. Yep. I mean, it is just, you know, it's a really, really difficult thing. Everybody has their different perspective. When it's great, it's great. But, and when it's not great, then decide. You know, I you hear guys quit all the time saying, listen, I don't do this for the money. I do it for fun and I'm not going to put up with that crap. I'm not going to get called out. I'm not going to this, that, and the other. And they they leave. You know, right. they, they go, they, they leave. Again. I hear that all the time in bands that don't work. It's like, you know, listen, there's not enough money here for me to put up with that, you know, aggravation. Yeah. And I get it. And then, you know, there's other people who are just so happy to be in a band and then there's bands that communicate well. And then there's bands that, you know, again, this could be, if you're lucky enough, like it sounds like fling, you guys have a pretty good uh, rhythm 
Um, Pretty really, good. It's not perfect. We we screw it up. Hardly ever, right? Right, right. And, yeah, and even if you screw sure. up, the intention is there's enough trust that you can kind of work your way back from the screw up, right? That's exactly, yes, that's exactly right. That's a good thing. Yep. And again, even in leader-led bands, there are good leaders who are really good people motivators and problem solvers, just like in any walk of life. Just, yeah. And there are, there are leaders who like... You know, it's it's it, it's going to go my way, and that's the only way it's going to go. And if you don't like it, you can leave. I'll get another guy, and that's probably not. You know, if it's paying you a lot of money. I, and again, I know I know side men who it's their living, and they'll just smile and show up and let a bad leader, you know, be a jerk. You know, to some to some extent, there's a line, but you know, if it pays the bills, they'll they'll take the gig. Yeah, I mean, we you know we heard that from some of the guests we've had, Absolutely. you know, on the show over the years. So. Yeah, it, you know that whole friend thing that Eric asked. It's uh, it's such a fascinating question because every situation is different, every person is different, every every combination of people creates a creates a a vibe of communication that's different, and it's so important. And you know, maybe sometimes it's not the leader. And I would say there's certain situations in my band where I know I'm the wrong guy to insert myself. And I know someone else will, and there'll be the right temperature to cool a situation down or, or give some clarity to a situation. A good leader can let other people kind of you know, step mm. in and, and do their thing as well in the interest of keeping the whole ship moving forward. The, and I'll go back to that other, that thread that I was having, like, you know, again, there's, there's this, you know, this guy who said, I own everything. And so, you know, I will hire you and, you know, you'll show up and, and I'll pay you and that's good. And, you know, a bunch of musicians saying, I would never play for you. You know, that's the way you look at it, that just because you own all the equipment and do all the booking that you think you're better than me. Well, like I never said better than me. Right? Oh, no, he's just in but, charge. But, but, that's all. But it's just, two different but things. It, right. but, but all the emotions that kind of came out and you amplify that, that they're, you know, someone behind a keyboard, you know, a thousand miles away and people can be as kind of, you know, fussy as they want about it. But I think that that's the thing is, is um, musicians are different, certainly different than business people. Um, and some of the communication rules just don't apply. They're just going to be counterproductive in a creative environment like this. Yeah. I mean, I've never sat in a room of, of you know, like people writing a script. I've never sat in a room of people trying to, trying to um, animate a story or something like that. I think that would be really fascinating to know. How I'm going to imagine it's similar to sitting in a in a room of a bunch of musicians, mm -hmm. creative people. You know, they have their the reason they're good at being creative is you know whatever their life situation is or their natural talents are. Applying those natural talents, you know, sometimes if mommy or daddy are over their shoulder, it will stifle them. Sometimes it'll encourage them. You know, if if you know your significant other is having a bad day. Sometimes it'll, you know, stifle them. Sometimes it'll encourage them. Right. And yeah. just getting that magic of people in a good space who can be harnessed to create something cool. I think that it is kind of magic. And then you take it out all the way to the end. And that really is why we get things like, you know, four kids from Liverpool. Um, how did, how did that amazing music get created? Right. How did that, some of the parts where the, the, the the magical combination of their all their lives ex experiences all of a sudden started creating music that was like you could never have imagined yeah yeah that's true i know it's crazy when it works it works when it works it works that's right yeah yeah and it's a beautiful thing when it works and that the and trick it's a is, heartbreaking thing when it doesn't yeah well and it it can be fleeting too it it doesn't just because it's working right now doesn't mean it works you know tomorrow or a year from now and and it takes work to keep it working so i know it gets a little meta man this was a good one we dug into a lot of weird stuff today for us <laughs> not weird but but different so i like it all right, folks. Well, that's it. I will tell you, Paul, since you can't hear it, that I'm starting the music now because uh, we have a little technical issue on our end. So I trust you, Dave. Yeah, well, there you go. It's how, see, that's how it works. That's it. <laughs> All right. Even, even while I can't hear the music, I know that I wish for everybody to always be performing. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> we will see you next time, folks. Take it easy.